This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, Jay Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Brian, walk our listeners through building what you would consider a perfect rest. Um, talk, talk me through how, how you consider the rest to be perfect as far as using a backpack and what have you. Okay, that's an interesting question. I have a lot of guys that say they just like to shoot off a backpack. And a backpack is not a bad rest, but it's not as good as a bipod. And here's why. So let's say we know there's Marco Polo a mile, a mile from here. And we ride around the corner and we ride on this ridge and we come up to the saddle and we leave the horses. And we got to crawl. We get up on top and we can belly crawl an extra 50 to 100 yards if we're on our bellies versus, you know, on our uh, feet or bending over. So now you got your pack on. Well, how do you belly crawl with a pack on? Well, it's not very easy, so you end up dragging your pack beside you when the animals can see you or you get tired. So I prefer to have a bipod if I know that I'm shooting on the prone. I can always shoot with the pack. So, But if I don't have a bipod on, now I have to shoot with the pack or I have to shoot with a rock or I have to shoot with something. So I carry one or two things. When I'm mountain hunting, I'm not weight conscious. I will use a 9 to 13-inch Harris bipod. I think it's called the Type S model, the kind that pivots. So, so if you're on a slope, you can level it. And I also put a lever lock on it, so it comes with a, it comes with a little neural little knob that tightens the, the pivoting. But I, I tend to get a lever. There's several companies that make them. It's a lever lock, so when you when you um, put the rifle in a proper shooting position, you, you turn the knob and it locks the gun in on the so it's, it locks it on a level plane. So now you don't can't the gun. Um, and I use my hand or either sometimes I use a cartridge carrier. I, I typically use like an Uncle Mike's or some kind of similar cartridge carrier that folds like a wallet. And you put five bullets or six bullets on the top and six on the bottom or five on the bottom, depending if it's a Magnum or standard model. Fold it together. It goes in your pocket like a wallet. And I'll use that. I'll squeeze that. And I'll put that underneath my butt stock and with my hand. And that will be a very solid anchor. I mean, you can get these little bean bags and different rests, but they're, they're heavy that you got to carry in the field if you're backpacking. If you're not backpacking, I would use, again, I know Holland makes a good one. The guy at the Best of West had a good one. Several different kinds that you can roll up or they're square and they go underneath the butt. Because a lot of hunters, they'll balance the front of the gun, but they don't balance the back of the gun. So when the gun shoots, uh, it goes off. The gun recoils up and, and and back and goes underneath their arm and it was more likely to scope them or if you know worst case scenario they miss because it, it lifts off so if i'm purely backpack hunting and hunting with a scabbard on a horse and i don't want the hair's bipod because it's inconvenient you know, not convenient to take on and off i might use what they call a snipe pod a company in montana sells it great product simple light it's not as stable as a harris bipod but it's very simple and light um and it doesn't torque the gun at all. So with a Harris bipod, always mount the Harris bipod so the legs go forward towards the barrel, not backwards towards the, uh, the trigger and the stock. And, um, and on a Harris bipod also, try and shoot on a similar surface. Don't shoot on concrete and then shoot in the boulder field because it's going to, uh, on concrete or slick snow, it's going to slide well. And if you shoot it on heavy carpet or, say, dirt or rocks, and that bipod, especially on a heavy recoil gun, it'll want to make the gun ju- jump and shoot high. So if you're going to shoot a Harris bipod, just make sure you test it and you zero it for the same type of conditions you're going to be shooting at. So if you're at the camp and there's snow, you know, don't shoot on a horse blanket. I shoot on the snow. So the bipod's on the snow because when I'm in the mountains, the bipod's on the snow. So I look for consistency. The Harris bipod is not as much better for shooting on snow than a snipe pod because the snipe pod is basically like, tent pegs um, that have a, they're on a ball bearing system that can pivot three, you know, you know, they can pivot all directions, just not forward and backwards, but you have to dig them into the ground. So if the ground's frozen, the snipe pod, when you shoot it, the gun will fall on the ground. Um, there is a company, and I always forget the name of it, it's a really heavy duty um, bipod system that runs on a Picatinny rail, and it has click out adjustable legs, and it also folds forward like a Harris, and it, it, it pivots really nicely, except it's very heavy. Um, and it typically mounts best on a Picatinny rail if you mount that, if you have that mounted to your gun. Um, 
and that's a pretty good system. A lot of the guys who shoot the AR, the black guns, will use those guns, those tripods and bipods. Um, and also on the Harris bipod, you can get the one that pulls out in increments, like one inch increments, or you can get the one that pulls out and you just tighten a little um, uh, little tensioner. I probably prefer the ones that pull out and click on one inch increments. It's a little bit faster for field hunting conditions. And again, really anchor the back. If you're shooting your gun on a backpack um, and the gun's a heavy recoiling gun, I'll actually sometimes put my hand on top of the scope. Again, you need to practice with the range. So when you shoot, the gun doesn't recoil back. Um, so if you just put your gun hand underneath the back of the stock, which is the most stable position, and you shoot, some of these light guns will jump and sometimes hit a guy in the face. So especially if they're shooting uphill. So shooting uphill prone is the most difficult position to shoot in. And so a lot of times, once the angle becomes really steep, I can actually use my pack and the bipod. So I'll throw my pack down, and I always carry a fairly big pack, so it's at least 8 or 10 inches thick. And I throw the bipod out, extend the legs. Now I can shoot uphill at, say, 25 or 30 degree angle from a prone position. But if you have a big recoiling magnum, it's going to whack you in the eye if you're not careful. So if I go super steep shooting uphill, I, a lot of times I'll shoot off of a, a tripod that I use for my spotting scope. So I'll take the spotting scope off, adjust the tripod, lean up against a, like a rock or a tree, and put my body at, a, say, a 30 or 40 degree angle so it's facing, you know, so my body is facing the hill, not where my neck and stuff is can canted back. And I'll put my left shoulder on a rock or a tree, not my right shoulder because that's where the recoil is, and that stabilizes me. And then I'll put a glove or a stocking cap or a beanie or something on top of the bipod, uh, I mean on top of the tripod, and I'll set my gun on top of there. And now i got a super stable 500-yard rest where I'm not going to scope myself. And the advantage of shooting in a sitting position especially on bears or animals that are going to move or need follow-up shots, it's much easier to get a follow-up shot shooting from a standing, not a standing or sitting position, or even a standing position for that matter, than a prone position. So shooting from a prone position, really critical in my opinion, if you're going to be mountain hunting, to shoot with a, either a heavy gun or some type of a muzzle brake. I hate muzzle brakes for your ears, but, I mean, they're really, really nice for follow-up shots because um, the muzzle jump is just minimized. So I like, if you're going to shoot a light gun, you really need a muzzle brake from shooting prone. Otherwise, your second shot is going to be a blur. You won't be on the target. You won't be able to see where your bullet hits. So I always take a gun, if I have my choice, that I can call my own shots. Because if you're hunting internationally and you don't have a guy like me with you, assume the guide can't tell you exactly where you hit. Um, if he does, he maybe gets excited and explains it differently. And I've had that done to me where they told me you hit here. Well, I didn't hit there. I only I only missed it by two inches, and I thought it, they told me I missed it by like a foot. So then I overcorrect, and then miss again. Um, so you have to really be know your weapon. And and in my opinion, if you're going to hunt internationally, think of it as like you're hunting a solo bighorn hunt or a solo um, stone sheep hunt. If you're a BC resident, you don't have anybody with you. You have to be able to call your shots, range your animal, and and make a follow up shot if you don't hit him all the first shot. And not many people can do that. So anyway. Again, don't uh, you don't you believe, Brian, um, on your on your second shot, whether it's a hit uh, or let's say it's a miss, you're better off correcting smaller increments than if you think you missed them by three feet. Can you talk a little bit about second follow up shots and, and kind of your logic if you're by yourself saying you don't have someone calling your shot? What is your protocol? You know, I've, I've been pretty lucky, and I've never really missed big animals by myself. I've missed animals, of course, but luckily they're, I've hit them on the second shot or third shot, or they weren't really big animals. They weren't trophy animals. They were just fun hunting, coal hunting or something in Australia. But in general, you need to be able to see where your bullet hits, and that's why I tell guys that they take these long-range shooting courses where they're shooting at steel targets, um, where they can see, okay, I'm six inches high and six inches right, make a quick follow-up shot and correct for it. Um, a really good shooter um, that has a partner, they get the use to calling their shot corrections in either inches or MOA. Uh, the military will typically do a mill correction, um, which most hunters don't want to know what a mill is. It's just a different a different uh, angle of measurement, different type of measurement, similar to MOA, but just a bigger increment. So, I mean, if you're missing by three feet, you either really pulled the trigger bad or it's way it's from the rain finder's not working. I mean, yeah, you try and make... So you try and see exactly where your first bullet hit, and assuming the wind is the same, and make an instant correction. So if you're shooting an animal, let's say you're holding on his shoulder, um, 
or not on the shoulder, let's say you're holding behind the shoulder in the heart lung area, and you shoot, and it hits the animal in the flank, um, and he's still standing there, and you can see he's hit back far. Well, then do an instant correction. You know your bullet was a foot to the right. You hold, you know, a foot in front, you know, not a foot in front of him, but you hold five or six inches in front of him and, and do a quick follow-up shot to try and anchor him. Um, that's where I mean, that's where if you can see your bullet hit, not only misses, but also hits, you can avoid a lot of wounded animals and, and chasing things and lost animals. So when you shoot an, shoot an animal, too many guys, the animal drops, everybody's doing high fives. Well, I always worry when an animal drops in its tracks at long range, it's either a perfect shot or it's not a perfect shot. And it's about 50, 50. If you hit an animal high above the spine, but it hit the spine bone, but don't break the spinal column, it'll typically drop in his tracks. He'll be stunned, and then five to 30 seconds later, he'll get up, shake himself off, and take off running. Or if you shoot a bighorn sheep or a Marco Polo through the horn, close to the base, it can do the same thing. So you can drop him, boom, think he's dead, he gets up, shakes himself off, and runs away. So anytime you do a, an animal drops in his track, you right away should know, okay, I either hit him in the head or in the upper neck or the shoulder. So that means you hit too high. So your correction shot should be lower and probably further back, um, depending. And so that's where a good guide or a good hunting partner will be able to tell you what happened. And uh, But again, some people don't have hunting partners with them or a guide with them who speaks English. And sometimes the guy just doesn't see where the bullet hit. So that's why it's really important, again, to shoot a gun that doesn't have big recoil and that you can see where your bullet hits after the first shot. That's really key. So, I mean, guys, for example, let's say a lot of guys like a 300 Ultra Mag. Well, a 300 Ultra Mag and a seven and a half pound gun with or without a muzzle brake is not what I would recommend, especially without a muzzle brake. It's too much. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to scope yourself. You're going to be scared of the gun. Uh, you're going to be no chance of seeing the bullet impact uh, and, and, for, and no chance of quick follow-up shots. With the muzzle brake, it's manageable, but you're better off with an 8 or 9 or 10-pound gun if you're shooting a big gun like that. If you want a 6.5 or 7.5-pound finished weight rifle, shoot a 260 Remington or a 243 or a 6.5-06 or something like that. Don't, sh you know, don't shoot a 300 Ultra Mag or a 338 Lapua. And not only that, but those big guns are harder on the stock and they're harder on the, on the scope. So you're more likely to stocks, which almost never happens really. I've seen it happen, but it doesn't happen often. Most likely a stock will break from falling down the mountain or a horse wreck. Um, but for sure, I've seen scopes damaged and rattled apart by big guns. So you know, if you want a big gun, shoot a heavy gun. If you want a lightweight gun, shoot a smaller caliber or, and, and consider the muzzle brake. And I like muzzle brakes that you can take on and off. Or let's say if I have a, a 300 Magnum that I want to shoot on a sheep hunt, I can put the muzzle brake on for shooting prone. And if I want to shoot it on a brown bear hunt or I want to shoot on a moose hunt, where I'm probably going to be shooting standing or, or sitting, I'll take the muzzle brake off, put a cap on it so it covers the threads. I'll have to re-zero the gun because the gun will hit slightly different point of impact. I mean, the, the bullet gap will be the same. The velocity should be the same. But you'll have to re-zero your gun because it changes the harmonics of the barrel um, when you and the weight of the barrel. So your, your first round and your, well, definitely if I took the gun, took the, 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 uh, the cap off and put the muzzle brake on or vice versa, for sure it'll have a different point of impact. And you have to change that. But that's one way if you want to hunt with one gun, let's say you like a 300 Winchester Magnum or a 300 Weatherby, and you want a lighter weight gun and you want to shoot it prone, then put the, put the muzzle brake on. You want to shoot it for moose and bears, put the cap on and shoot without the muzzle brake. Because definitely it's when you're shooting off a set of shooting sticks or off a, you know, off a tree or something, um, you don't have to have the, uh, the recoil is not as severe as when you're shooting prone. That's all great stuff right there. Um, let's take a quick break here and we'll get right back into the interview. Okay. Tired of relying on out-of-date numbers, spending too much on hunting consultants and seeing too little results? With Go Hunt Insider, the old way of doing things is over. With the introduction of draw odds and filtering 2.0, you'll have access to the most accurate, up-to-date information in the industry. You can filter by state, species, trophy potential, weapon, specific days or months of the year, harvest success rate, male-to-female ratios, and much more. All of this leads to easily finding the best hunt for you. So what are you waiting for? Visit GoHunt.com slash Insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. 
Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code until February 28th to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Brian, that's all great stuff there. Um, you know, people can definitely learn a lot from listening to to, to all of that first intercha- inter- exchange there between uh, you and I, and that's all just awesome stuff for the hunters uh, and the listeners to um, take in. I wanted to uh, shift focus a little bit here and talk specifically, kind of go through uh, a gear uh, that you use. And obviously, you know, gear that you use is is totally different on every hunt, for every animal, for every conditions and what have you. Yeah. Um, but let's let's bang through some of these um, uh, ge- a gear list and have you kind of walk through uh, some of the different gear that you use. So um, let's start out with backpacks. And why don't you walk me through some of the different backpacks for certain conditions that you use and why you use them and such. Okay. Um, so the first thing is with backpacks <laughs> is I always hunt with a bigger pack than I might need. So, for example, let's say I go on a backpack, a solo backpack trip, and I could use a 5,000 cubic inch pack. Well, that's if I don't shoot an animal. Um, so if I shoot an animal, I'm going to have stuff strapped to my pack. It's going to look like a Christmas tree, and it overloads the pack. It overloads the tensioners. And so I always typically hunt with a bigger pack than I can because I can take a 7,000 cubic inch pack and shrink it down to 2,000. I can take a 5,000 inch cubic inch pack and shrink it down to 2,000. So I always tell most guys, get a little bit bigger pack than you think because it's nicer to have stuff inside the pack than strapped onto it. So, and then you're, so you, there's two types of main packs. There's, well, I guess there's three kinds. There's like the full external frame pack, which is a, a standard aluminum freighter frame, uh, camp trails, Bernie Sports Lay in Alaska, um, Black Creek makes one, uh, a company in Canada, uh, the Wilderness Wanderer made a good, uh, makes a good pack. They're all heavy duty. I call them the guide packs, the meat packs, you know, put 150 pounds in them, strap them in and go, but they're not super comfortable. You can't really strap them to a horse as well. Uh, and you can't really fly with them and carry it. I mean, you definitely can never use one as carry on. And if you put them as check luggage, you know, you have to put them inside of a duffel or something. So the frames don't get caught on a conveyor belt and break. I, I've had a couple hunters show up with Kelty packs that they broke in transit because they had a weak point in the bottom. So I, um, I typically use now, uh, I call it like a hybrid or like a, internal frame, external frame type hybrid where you have the frame is low profile, typically carbon fiber, fiberglass. It, it's inserted into a bag. Uh, and this would be like Mystery Ranch, Kafaru, Stone Glacier, those kind of bags. Um, the company called QU, they kind of make a hybrid pack too. It's kind of an external frame, but it's a flat carbon fiber frame. So you don't really run it by itself. You could, but most guys leave it on. But again, you can switch the bags. So the frame is the same, and you switch to depend the bag. If you want a 4,000, 7,000, 6,000 cubic inches bag, you can switch it on the frame. So for me, and I, if you had to take a pack, absolutely bomb-proof, abuse the crap out of it, destroy it, you know, probably Mystery Ranch and Kufaru probably make the toughest bags. Now, Kufaru also makes some lighter weight bags. So Mystery Ranch is going to make a lighter weight bag. I know they're working on it, but typically Mystery Ranch never made anything like They were designed for military, firefighters, special forces, hunting extreme hunters. Um, the downside of any of the internal frame packs is if you, unless you know how to pack the bag right and you don't put the weight in the right place, you, ha- you typically have to lean over further than you want. And so it puts a lot of extra pressure and strain on your lower back um, versus uh, an external frame pack, which is more rigid and doesn't flex, then you can load the weight higher. So if you're going to use an internal frame pack or like the hybrid packs that I talked about, I would say light low, so LL and heavy high. So you need the weight high and you, you don't want the weight low. If you have the low weight low, you're going to be leaning over and you also want it close to your back. Think of a pack, 
um, kind of like a big lever arm. The further you have it from your back, the more lever you have, uh, leverage you have. So if you had a 12-inch crescent versus a 6-inch crescent, the 12-inch crescent has a lot more leverage to undo a tight bolt than a 6-inch crescent. So same thing. If you load your backpack with the weight heavy in the back of the pack, it'll make you have to lean over a lot further to balance that weight. The closer you can keep the weight to your back, the closer you can keep the meat, the water, uh, the food, whatever, close to your back, and the, cl and the more you can keep your gloves and your rain gear and your down parka towards the back, the lighter it is. So the bottom of my pack, I always fill it with sleeping bag, uh, therm rest or ridge, uh, ridge rest, whatever you have in the bottom, and you put your mountain house down there. And so the stuff you don't need for the day, you put in the bottom of your pack. And then up from there, I put my cook kit, um, my stove, extra clothes that I know I won't need. And then as I go up, the top of my pack has the stuff that I need for the day. You know, dry long underwear top, a layering jacket, you know, my rain gear, if it's light, will probably be in an external pocket, depending on how it is, or strapped to the pack. But, you know, the only thing I put on the outside back of the pack are lighter things. My spotting scope tripod and stuff either goes inside my pack close to my body or I leave it strapped to my the, the, the tripod. I strap the gun on one side of the pack and the spotting scope and tripod on another so I keep the weight close to my body. I don't like in the mountains the packs that the gun goes in upside down and goes the butt goes the barrel goes down between your ass cheeks because if you fall down or sit down, it's on the, you know, you're going to land on the gun. So I like packing my gun so it's level with the bottom of my pack and higher. So if I sit down or fall down, I don't slap the gun on the ground and knock it off. Um, or, I, it, or I'll carry it on what they call a rifle gun bearer system the, from Kafaru, which I'm going through the bush. It works well in grizzly country. I can get to it pretty quickly. And so they make a, a gun bearer system for either, um, uh, for either their own packs or for any, in, any pack of the universal adapter. So again, right now, what I've been using for lightweight packs is I've been using a stone glacier and a, and a kafaru. And for heavy, heavy weight stuff, um, I still have my big mystery ranch. It's an 8,500 cubic inch, but the pack weighs 13 pounds. So if you're carrying a 130-pound load, that's only 10% of the weight. Um, if you're carrying a 50-pound load, it's pretty heavy. It's 30% of the weight. So if you're carrying light loads or I'm traveling internationally, I've been using lighter packs like the Stone Glacier, the, the Kafaro, those are five, six pound packs. Um, always carry extra hip buckle. I usually always have a rain fly um, in my pack because if it's raining and snowing, the amount of weight you save on the rain fly is trivial compared to how much a pack will absorb in snow, rain and ice and frozen zippers. And I use that, that rain fly when I'm organizing my pack and my gear in the morning, I lay it on the ground and I put the gear on top of the, uh, the rain fly and uh, organize it and then put up my tent and then throw the stuff inside. So anyway, in a nutshell, that's how I do my packing and I'll, I'll carry my big, my big pack. I'll just shrink it down and use it as a day pack. So when I do shoot an animal, I can expand the pack and throw the animal in and get out of there. I mean, I've done a lot of sheep solo where I can carry the entire animal, all the legal meat, the life size cape in my camp but your minimum 140 pounds, 145 pounds, maximum 165 to 170 pounds. So it's not for the faint of heart. And uh, I don't really recommend it unless you've done it before because that's enough weight. Most beds, if they fall, they can't get back up, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's how I've hunted my entire life. I need to take better care of myself now as I get older because I, you know, I need, I need to lose some weight now. <laughs> Too much time in the office, uh, not exercising enough in the off season. I can still do it but I'm not as spry as I was when I was 25, you know? So um, you got to really keep, as you get older, you got to keep everything flexible and, and, um, and train because you're more prone to get injuries also. Absolutely. I've been using that uh, Kuyu Icon Pro 7200. And like one of the things you said is I really like it because uh, it can expand when I really need it. But most of the time I have, the different straps and buckles and it's you know probably more like a 3000 cubic inch uh you know carrying my spotting scope and a lot of my gear uh for my you know day hunting in and out mm -hmm. um but when i want to go on those overnight hunts and 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 or if if i uh am successful and get an animal it can expand and can pretty much pack uh, most anything out um i don't ever carry extreme weight like what you're talking about um 
but I know that in certain situations, being able to carry over 100 pounds would, would really, really come in handy for sure. Um, what would you say, the older you get, do you try and limit yourself as far as weight and not go over a certain amount of weight? No, I'm not that smart yet. <laughs> so you'd rather just kill yourself coming out but make one trip because going back in to wherever you're at a second time is a lot of times not an option. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance product formulations. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order in January 2016. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Yeah, I mean, there's several reasons I do it. Sometimes I'm doing it in between hunts where I'm guiding hunters, and it saves me a day. Um, or it saves me, I've never had a bear, really, I mean, maybe he steals a few scraps here and there but I've never had a bear steal my cape or my horns or anything like that because I've always taken everything in one trip um, or I take it within a day. I mean, the other option is shuttling meat. So I have some of my friends, they like to shuttle their loads. So let's say they're 10 miles in, they'll pack it two miles, go back light, grab the load and come back. That way they say they don't have as much weight on their back all the time. And what kills you is when you have heavy amounts of weight for long periods of time. And it just, I could basically call it, it just smashes you. It just, you know, I mean, I've had trips where, I mean, 150 pounds is a lot of weight on a guy. And whether you're yeah. a 300 pound guy or a 170 pound guy, it's a lot of weight, and it puts a lot of pressure on your back, your spine, your shoulders. Uh, my legs are fine and everything with it, but just the upper body just pushes you down and uh, hurts. So, I mean, I can walk all day with 80 or 100 pounds on if I have to. I don't like it, but I can. But you're sure as heck not going to walk all day with 150. I can tell you that. Yeah, for you know, sure. I mean, 20 minutes, 20 minutes of time is hell. You know, absolutely, so. absolutely. Let's shift to sleeping bags. Uh, what sleeping bags do you run and why? You know, of all the products, I, I, I really don't care about the model or the make of the sleeping bag as much as I do about the design. So if it's a dry temperature, cold, dry, always go with a down bag normally. If you in a, in a condition where you're going to have a lot of condensation, humidity, rain, damp tents, not not, not much wind, go with the synthetic bag. So. If you're going to be hunting when it's, say, say 25 Fahrenheit up to, say, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or not even say 80, that's pretty extreme. Let's say at night, say 25 to 45, 25 to 50, I would go with the synthetic bag That's if it's wet. You know, if you're going to have a good tent and you're going to be at Alpine a lot where it's going to have a lot of wind, I'll run a down bag all the time. I have three different temperature zones for down bags. I have like a... 20, 25 degree bag for down. I have a, say a minus 15, minus 20, and then I have a minus 40. And then I have a couple of synthetics. I run a, I have a 35 to 40 degree synthetic that I'll use on spring hunts where it won't freeze at night. And then I have um, a synthetic that's like a 15 or 20 degree synthetic that I'll, if I'm going on a spring brown bear hunt or something like that, that's what I'll use. But in general, Asia, pretty much down. You don't get, it's not high, high moisture, maybe a tour hunt in the summer conditions, you might use a synthetic bag where it rains more, but in general, it's dry, so down bag is a lot lighter. It takes up a lot less room. I can compress it. The biggest thing you just can't get down wet. If you're gonna sleep in really wet clothes at night, then down bag's not good because it'll push it down. Uh, it'll down get super saturated with moisture and it won't work. Where a synthetic bag, I can crawl inside a primal off type bag with wet clothes, and my body heat will push the moisture into the synthetic and out through the synthetic. And so the synthetic fibers don't collapse on you and um, they still maintain some loft where down fibers will collapse. 
and you'll get hot, sweaty, and clammy, and then you'll get cold because the down is saturated and it's nasty and won't dry out. So then you got to dry it out in the sun or the wind, which is sometimes difficult. So that's why mountain climbers and people who do the Arctic, they typically sleep in a vapor barrier, which goes inside their down bag, and it keeps their body moisture from getting the down wet. So if you're gonna if you're gonna sleep in really wet clothes, then I don't recommend a down bag. I'll sleep in slightly damp socks at night, but if I'm really wet, like you gotta take your clothes off and dry them in the sun if you're sleeping in a down bag. It'll it'll ruin the loft of your down if you're sleeping in wet clothes. And you won't sleep well at night either. I always sleep in damp socks, but I don't sleep in wet socks. So I try, I try and dry my socks out at night inside my sleeping bag. Another trick for sleeping is if you're sleeping in a conditions where your boots are going to freeze solid at night if they're leather and they got wet or something in a creek and you wake up in the morning, they're frozen solid, you don't have a tent or you don't have a stove to dry them out, I will put them inside a, zip, uh, a garbage bag and I'll put them inside my sleeping bag. So the, the boots go inside my sleeping bag at the bottom and what you can do at night is you can take a Nalgene one liter bottle, fill it with boiling water, and throw that inside, and that will keep your feet warm and thaw out your boots. And I also put my gaiters in there, and my gaiters are frozen solid. I'll put my gaiters in with my boots, and then my sink bag doesn't get wet because the, the boots are inside a good gar heavy, heavy duty garbage bag. And so always, I always get a large, tall sleeping bag. I don't get a standard. I'm six foot, six one, and I would get the large, tall, or the long, tall. Um, so there's a room for boots in there. So if you're a five foot eight, ten, six foot guy, get the long bag. If you're a, a six foot, uh, five foot five guy, five foot six guy, get the standard bag. Don't get the short bag. Um, I always tell people get one length longer than what you think you need. The other thing with sleeping bags, if you get a sleeping bag that's too tight and too restrictive, when you're when you're at night, if you're bundled up, and any place your body's pushing against a sleeping bag, it will kill the loft. So the loft is dead. And um, because it, it's compressed. So I, I don't like super tight sleeping bags. I like a bag that's a little bit looser. Yeah, it takes a little more room in your bag and your seat and in your backpack. Minimal. I use a good compression bag like the Sea to Summit, um, something like that. But I, uh, I like a little bit bigger bag because I, like I don't like the bag tight around me, claustrophobic, and that's easier to unzip and zip. And at night, always wear a headpiece, like it's two stocking cap or whatever. A beanie, something to keep your head, and you can learn to zip up the sleeping bag around your face, and it will keep you, it will keep you a lot warmer um, when you do it that way. Um, the other what thing, about sleep sleeping pad. Uh, sleeping pad pad is sometimes more important than the sleeping bag. <laughs> I like uh, a sleeping pad um, that's quite comfortable. Like I know Thermorest makes a couple good ones. A company called Xbed makes a really good one. Um, I use the Xbed Sinmat 7 and Downmat 7 Thermrest. The Neos Air is good. It's a little bit not super tough, so you can't abuse it. Um, I know Thermrest is always coming out with new models all the time. There's several other companies that make good sleeping pads. Big Agnes makes a decent one. Um, the Big Agnes bag combo with the sleeping pad works if you like to sleep on your back. But I like to sleep on my side. So I don't want a sleeping bag that doesn't have any insulation on the bottom of it. So what they've done is they've tried to eliminate some of the uh, insulation I mean, some of the, the weight of your sleeping bag by just putting the sleeping pad in the bottom of your bag, but you can't sleep on your side properly and keep the bag like wrapped around you. And the other way I like to sleep, if it's not very hot, if it, I mean, if it's pretty hot and not cold, I unzip, unzip the sleeping bag and throw it over me like a comforter. So let's say it's 40 degrees at night, I'll just sleep in my own underwear and throw the sleeping bag over me like a comforter and I sleep better, I don't get sweaty. So if I have a sleeping bag that's a minus 10 degree bag and it's 40 degrees out and I zip it up, I'm going to be sweating horrible. Um, if, I sleep, if I just throw it over me like a comforter, I don't get so hot. I don't sweat and don't get so stinky and everything else. So, and for a pillow, I just take, there's a, Therabrass makes a pillow slip. It's like a little fleece pillow slip and I stick my, my pile jacket or which is like a fleece jacket or put a synthetic I call it a puffy jacket, synthetic jacket, like it's the same material like in a sleeping bag or a down jacket. I put that in there, and that's my pillow. I don't like sleeping like jacket without some kind of a stuffed bag because it just falls apart and the sleeves fall out, so you've you got to tie it together. So some guys, they'll take their long underwear uh, top and put like a down jacket inside of that and tie it together, and it makes like a little sleeping bag, uh, sleeping pillow, and that works well. But I prefer to just get the Thermarest pillow slip and sleep that way. Um, and that's really critical. So again, me, I like a standard mummy bag that's that's wider than normal. I don't like the little profile mummy bags. Um, 
so like a, it's called like a semi like a semi mummy and that way I can zip it up all the way to my my neck and I don't get claustrophobic and then a good sleeping bag will have two or three drawstrings that go around your shoulders and head so you can keep your face outside the bag so you don't want your face inside the bag and I can roll over on my side I can sleep on my partial belly I can sleep on my back and the sleeping bag stays with me and if you're sleeping in the snow um, and your and your sleeping pad goes flat big problem. So I recommend using like a ridge rest or a, a Z rest or something along in conjunction with um, a, a foam pad or get a foam pad that has built-in closed cell foam in it. So in case the pad goes dead flat because it gets a sticker in it or you, you know you pop it or something, you still have some synthetic insulation between you and the ground. So that's really critical in a wintertime survival type situation is that sleeping pad. I'd rather have a sleeping pad and put all my clothes on and sleep on the pad than I would crawl inside a nice sleeping bag and have to sleep on the snow because that snow will suck the moisture right out of you. Uh, not the moisture, sorry, the heat. Um, it's, it's a very it's good amazing conductor. how cold the ground is. Yeah, I mean, if you have lichen, you can also take a handsaw and build up, build up a big area with a bunch of pine boughs, but honestly, a Z-Rest probably only weighs like six ounces or eight ounces. I mean, you can take that as long as emergency and sleep on it uh, in conjunction with a the Therm-Rest. And then you got the best of both worlds. you got the safety factor and then you got the comfort factor. So that's what I recommend if you want to be safe and practical. Okay, that's great stuff. Uh, tents? Um, good question. Tents are unique. Um, it depends if you want to go one man, two man, three man, sleep with a buddy, sleep um, sleep on your own. Sheep hunting, if you're going to be sleeping in really bad weather, really bad conditions, um, where you might have bad ledges and stuff to sleep on, I tell everybody, everybody takes their own one-man tent. That way, in case one guy has to stay back, he can stay in his tent. If somebody's got to hike out for some reason and pack their gear out, they can go, and the one guy can stay back with a game, meet, and rest for a day. If you take a two- or three-man tent, everybody's got to stay together, and there's no flexibility. This guy go around the mountain this way. This guy go around the mountain that way, and you also have less options for camping. A lot of times I can find two or three places to put a one-man tent or a bivy sack, but I can't put up a two- or three-man tent. So pretty much all the tents I use now are Hilleberg. I, I know that you know I'm – I work with the QU guys, and uh, their original tents were pretty decent. I never used them, but not bad. Their new tent, they make a new two-man uh, freestanding tent that's supposed to be really, really good. Um, but basically for tents, I just use Hillebrick for everything. You can't go wrong. They make freestanding tents, non-freestanding tents, big tents, little tents, tube tents, vestibules, no vestibules, floors. Um, you know, I mean, you name it, they have it. And... Uh, I, they're, they're basically, unless I want a big wall tent, then I'll use, you can use something like Montana Canvas. Uh, if you want to have a stove, lightweight stove backpack tent, you can use the Kafaru teepees are good. Um, you know, companies like Mountain Hardware, you know, Marmot, they make good tents. Um, Sierra Design, we used to use a lot of their tents. MSR makes good tents. Big Agnes, they all make good tents, but in my opinion, they're not the level of quality and strength of the Hilleberg tents. So... Hilleberg just knows how to make a bomb-proof tent. That's what they do. That's all they do. They don't make anything else. So that's what I probably stick with in general. And I prefer their one-man tents for sheep hunting. But if I'm going on a brown bear hunt where I want more room and I got to sleep in the tent or an Asian hunt where we got to sleep in the tent and live in it more, then I will use a, a, one of their GT-type models, which has a big vestibule on it. And we can put all our gear and horse tack and things inside of that. Or they make a, a, a standing tent called the, um, the Altai which you can actually stand up in and get it with or without a floor. And that's good for some of our spike tents. And then they make an Atlas, which is like a great big dome tent, like a super duty family tent. Think of a, think of a $2,000 Walmart special family tent <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that's six and a half feet tall and can handle 80 mile an hour winds. So, you know, that's a good tent. I just basically use air tents. Again, the other tents on the market are all good, um, but I find the Hilleberg just is hard to beat. They're probably the most expensive but I consider them the most, the mo they had the most models for everybody's need. The most important thing with a tent, and people forget this, is guying it out properly. If you don't guy it out properly, um, you're not going to do well. Hello? Rain gear. Um, so anyway, just let me, we'll say one more thing about the tents. Um, the biggest thing I see with people is they don't, I, I call it, there's a nickname my friend used to give me. He used to call me perfection erection. 
or techno erecto when it came to tents because I'm really anal about the tents. So when you set up the tent, you got to get it stretched out properly. Read the directions if you don't know how to do it because most people set up the tents not correctly. And it's fine if it's not correct until you get a big wind and you have 40, 50 mile an hour winds and it flattens the tent in the middle of the night and breaks your poles. So big time, always have enough stakes. I always carry a couple extra stakes and I carry the right stake for the right occasion. For example, with the, with the um, Hilleberg tents, I carry their titanium spikes when I'm camping in really rocky ground, frozen ground, whatever, that I need a tent that penetrates the ground easily uh, a peg is, and, and that uh, comes out easily if it's frozen. If I'm sleeping in more mossy lichen type conditions, I'll use their Y peg or their V peg and they make even a stronger peg. And they also make a round peg, which works fairly well too. It's a big round aluminum peg by Easton. But I typically just use their, their Y peg um, or their titanium. Basically, it looks like a great big titanium nail. And um, so I care, I have two different, if I'm going and traveling around the world and I'm hunting in frozen conditions, the titanium pegs. If I'm hunting in softer, wetter conditions, again, the Y peg, it just holds better. But if you put the Y peg in really frozen ground and it freezes at night, um, or you're trying to beat it into frozen ground and rocks, it'll bend it and break it. So again, take the right point. If you don't know what the conditions are, take both. They're not that heavy. If you, if I need 15 stakes for one and 15 of the other, I'll take 30 stakes. At least I know what I, and when I get to the area where I'm at, I'll leave the ones I don't need in base camp and take the other ones with me. So very critical, guying out the tent and making sure the guy lines are tight. And if you, if you set up the tent in wet fog or uh, heavy snow, the tent's going to sag in the first half hour or 20 minutes you set it up. So before I crawl into the bed, I'll go around and tighten all the guy wires up again. Otherwise, you'll have a saggy tent that's sagging on your head at night. So, and a freestanding tent doesn't need to be guyed out quite as critical as a, as a non-freestanding tent. A non-freestanding tent doesn't have the poles crossing. The poles are typically like individual poles. There's one pole and in three feet there's another pole and that's like a tunnel tent or a tube tent and those have to be guyed out to create the structure. Um, a freestanding tent typically has two, three, four, five poles across and the, the arc of the poles and the shape of the poles create the shape of the tent and they keep it upright, but it doesn't keep the poles from inverting it in a big windstorm and doesn't keep the tent from blowing away if you're not in it. So if you're going to be camping in big weather, you know, use the stakes, guy it out. And if it's going to be really windy, I put big rocks on every stake. Uh, very critical to stake out uh, the tent with big rocks on top of it. And what I do is where the stake and the guy line meet, um, I will put a big chunk of lichen or grass or dirt or something, the first six to 10 inches. So when the rock goes on top of the stake and goes on top of the guy line, and the tent's vibrating all night, it doesn't cut through the guy line because that guy line will cut on the rock and it will snap it. So that's a key. Um, and if you don't put the rocks on it, it'll work the guy line out during the night. It'll work it up. It's, it'll work the stake out of the ground. And then you'll have a collapsed tent. But you're going to have to get up in your skivvies at 2 in the morning and re-guy it out. So better to do it before you go to sleep where you know where the rocks and the lichen are so you have it done properly so you can sleep at peace. Very, very critical. Cool. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics.
Absolutely. Before we get to rain gear, uh, <clears throat> something that came to mind, you sleep in your skivvies or sleep in long underwear? Um, I typically, I'll sleep always in a t-shirt um, and with either boxer briefs and my, I sleep with my socks on. So I, I, sleep, I typically use tall socks you know, that go up over the calf. So even if I sleep in my skivvies, only my knees and my thighs are exposed. Um, so if it's really hot, I sleep in just my underwear and, uh, and say like a t-shirt. If it's really cold, I sleep in my long underwear top and long underwear bottom. But I rarely sleep, I mean, sometimes, honestly, I'll just see if, if I'm not dirty and sweating hard and not muddy, I'll just, if I have lightweight pants on, I'll just sleep in my pants <laughs> and, um, uh, just sleep in my long underwear top and, or a fleece top and just throw the sleeping bag over me like a comforter and ready to get up early in the morning and everything's dried out and, and uh, so if I'm slightly damp and I'm not worried about getting my sleeping bag really wet and I can dry it out during the day, then I will um, sleep that way. So it just depends. But, yeah, a lot of times I don't sleep, zip up my sleeping bag. Even. It's more comfortable. And you can sleep in a bigger variety of positions. Okay. Rain gear. Yeah, good question. Rain gear is a tricky question, a tricky topic. Nothing ever really works perfectly. Um for mountain hunting, I believe you want rain gear that fits really well. It doesn't have crotch sag, stays up. When you're hiking, I like full-length leg zips. I like pit zips. I like a good hood. Um, I like, you know, I don't necessarily need pockets in my pants, but I need a couple pockets in the jacket. I mean, I've had good luck with the QU rain gear. I've had good luck with a, um, the Art Cherix rain gear. The new Sitka rain gear is really good. I haven't used it. Um, it's a Gore-Tex product. There's a company that I use from called Audi, O T T E gear. Audi, Audi gear is or Ot gear is good. It's super tough, like industrial, military type grade, um, firefighter, uh, special forces rain gear. I like it. If you want to go, and that's all. These are all supposedly they call breathable laminates. Um, you know, I haven't used the cryptic rain gear, so I can't tell you. I mean, some of the Cabela's rain gear is okay if it has the Gore-Tex in it. Some of the stuff doesn't breathe very well. I remember um, some of the stuff called River's Edge, um, you know, was a pretty good rain gear if you're sitting, but if you're hiking, it's not too much in it. I don't like a rain gear that has any layers of insulation in it because it dries out too slowly. I like a three-plied Gore-Tex type, similar type rain gear, like, again, like the QU or the Sitka or the Arcteryx or the Mountain Hardware, any of that stuff is good. Um, if you want to go inexpensive, you can go with what I call like a laminated nylon, something like the Marmot Precip is a good one. And um, Mountain Hardware makes a similar rain gear. Fairly lightweight, fairly inexpensive. Um, you know, it's definitely waterproof. It doesn't breathe, but it doesn't matter if it breathes or not. I sweat horrible in any rain gear. If you're hunting grizzly bears or stuff on the coast, you can go with like the the Heli, Heli Hansen Improtec rain gear, which is that green kind of rubberized rain gear, and that's good for that kind of hunting, but I don't like it for backpack hunting. Uh, it doesn't fit me well. I get crotch sag and this legs that don't move well. Um, so. I mean, consider maybe getting suspenders. Rain gear. I like some nice rain gear suspenders. Uh, it keeps it up better because I don't like tight-fitting rain gear. And so if you want to keep it up, sometimes you got to get the belt too tight. So I typically don't wear suspenders other than I will with rain gear. Um, and anyway, make sure the rain gear is big enough. If you normally wear a large, I tell guys get an extra large because if you have layering materials underneath, sometimes I use my rain gear in place of pants. So if I'm hiking in the mountains and it's fairly hot, and it starts raining, I'll just keep my long underwear on and sleep and hike with my rain gear on my long underwear and keep my ra- keep my main pants wet, I mean, from getting wet. So if you have rain gear, long underwear, and pants, you have a very unique system. You can go rain gear only with your underwear, which is for very hot weather. You can go rain gear in long underwear, which is pretty universal down to freezing. You can go rain gear in your pants. You can go your long underwear, rain gear in your pants if you want to sit in glass and you want to stay warm and it's wet and you don't want to put your puffy pants on. So we talked about the puffy jacket type things, and I'm talking about like your puffy pants, which is an insulated pant, but you don't want to hike in them. But for sitting and glassing, they're good and they're convenient. And um, so if it's wet, though, you may not want to put them on because they'll be wet. Or if you have rain gear that's dry, you can take your rain gear off, put your puffy pants on, put your rain gear over the top of them and sit there. But if you got a large pant and you're normally a 35-inch waist, well, You'll never fit that stuff underneath it. So, again, go with the extra large, and then you can fit the stuff underneath. So, in rain gear, way better to have loose than it is to be too tight. And also, does, you don't care about the crotches and everything either if it's uh, loose. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. 
Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card when signing up for the GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster. Hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com Insider and join today.